isn't it a blessing to be in God's house with God's people? Uh, we also welcome those who are viewing on Facebook, maybe later on YouTube. We welcome you to the service today and pray that you will receive a blessing from your participation with us in worship and in God's word today. It's not always easy coming up with songs for the congregation to sing. So here I am making this appeal. I am putting out an appeal to the folks who are here in the congregation, to those of you out there on Facebook and YouTube. Um, make a request. Make a request of a song you would like for us to sing, and maybe we will sing it. Um, just leave a little message there, a little note on the uh, little comment on the sermon if you're on Facebook. And if you're in the congregation, just write it down and put it on the pastor's desk back there in the, in the office. I should tell you that the song director holds all veto power. <laughs> so if it's one that I don't think we could do, uh, I, I'll exercise that veto, but we'll do our best to sing all the songs that you would like to sing.
scripture passage this morning comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 12, verses 24 through 33. Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls unto the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life, life in the world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said, It had a hundred thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the, from the earth, will draw all people to myself. This he said, satisfying by what death he would die. Have you ever heard about the olive tree of Vouvet? or more specifically, the olive tree of the village of Anno Vuve on the island of Crete. You ever hear about that? No. Well, you are about to hear about the olive tree of Vuve. No later than the time of Christ, no later than the time of Christ, no, no later than 2,000 years ago, and perhaps as far back as the days of Abraham, 3,500 or 4,000 years ago, on the island of Crete, under the sunny and humid air of the Mediterranean Sea and within the fertile soil of that region, one seed from an olive tree began to germinate whether planted into the ground or fallen to the earth, that once dormant seed cracked its shell and from one dying seed, life sprang forth into a healthy, producing olive tree. And in the village of Anno Vuve, on the island of Crete, that olive tree, at least 2,000 years old, and maybe as old as 4,000 years, that olive tree still stands, it still grows. And though its trunk is twisted and gnarled, the olive tree of Vouve still produces succulent fruit from which olive oil is made. The government of Greece recognizes the olive tree of Vouve as a protected natural monument. And the tree even has a museum dedicated to it. And this one tree, the olive tree of Vouve, is held in such honor that branches from this tree were used to weave Victor's wreaths from the winners of the 2004 Athens Olympics, as well as the 2008 Beijing Olympics. And though a different species of plant, the olive tree of Vouve, once a dying seed, stands as a testament to one of Jesus' significant sayings. It is a saying that Jesus offered in the gospel according to John chapter 12 and verse 24, where Jesus said, and Mitchell read for us, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. 
But if it dies, if it dies, it produces much fruit. And that statement, that significant saying of Christ, and some of those statements that surround it speak of the necessity of Jesus' death. It's a statement that speaks of the manner of Jesus' death. And it also speaks of the result of Jesus' death. Let's first see the necessity of Jesus' death. In order for a seed to do what it is intended to do, it has to be put into the ground. And being put into the ground is at least a picture of death. And some would suggest, though I am not botanically inclined, some would suggest that in order for that seed to do what it is intended to do, it has to die. And likewise, Jesus, in order for him to accomplish that which he was intended to accomplish, Jesus must die. Earlier, as we learned in John chapter 12, earlier Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha, she recognized the necessity of Jesus' death. You may recall that while Jesus sat at a table eating, she brought costly ointment and anointed his feet with it. And then she wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the aroma of that costly ointment. And while Judas Iscariot scorned such a worshipful act as wasteful, Jesus halted him saying, let her alone, let her alone for the day of my burying she has kept this. She said, or Jesus said, that Mary was actually preparing Jesus for his burial. And in that once worshipful act, Mary demonstrated that she understood what few others understood. She understood that Christ had to die, that Christ must die. In fact, thinking that Jesus' influence grew among the Jewish people and throughout the Jewish nation, thinking that as that influence grew, so grew the likelihood that the Romans would come and take away the Jewish nation, Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest, said, it is expedient for us, it is beneficial for us, it is even necessary for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. He was probably speaking out of his own self-interest. He probably didn't realize that he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation of Israel only, but that Jesus would gather together in one all of the children of God that were scattered abroad. Caiaphas probably didn't realize that, but even as one of his chief opponents, whether he was motivated by self-interest or sacrifice, he even recognized the necessity of Jesus' death. Jesus' disciple, Peter, the boldest of the disciples, either did not see or did not accept the necessity of of Jesus death Peter either didn't see it or he wasn't willing to accept that Jesus had to die when Jesus began to to explain to his disciples how that he had to go to Jerusalem how that he had to at Jerusalem suffer many things at the hand of the elders and the 
chief priests and the scribes, when Jesus began to say that he had to go to Jerusalem to suffer and to be killed, Peter actually took Jesus and began to rebuke Jesus, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. Far be it from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. You aren't going to die. Jesus turned to Peter and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. When Peter protested that Jesus would die, Jesus actually turned to Peter and said to him, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things of God. You savor the things of men. Jesus' death was so essential to the plan of God for the redemption of fallen humanity that Jesus said to resist it, to resist his death and to work to prevent his death was not the work of God, but the work of Satan himself. He said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. So Jesus knew the necessity of his own death. When Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter, still determined to defend Jesus even with the sword, but Jesus informed Peter that if he wanted, if Jesus wanted, he had the strength of 12 legions of angels at his disposal. And then he asked, But how then shall the scripture be fulfilled that thus it must be? How then would the scripture be fulfilled that Christ must die? And even after Jesus rose from death, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus spoke to two unwitting disciples and suggested to them that they should not be surprised at Jesus' death because if he was indeed the Christ, it was necessary for him to suffer such things and necessary for him to die. The very purpose, the very purpose for which Jesus came to this earth, the very purpose for which Jesus left the splendor and glory of heaven and came to this earth as a human being, the very purpose for which he came was to die for the sins of all of mankind and it is clear to me that Jesus knew that. He knew it. Not from the time that the chief priests and the elders began to plot his death. He knew it not even from the moment that Adam ate of the forbidden tree necessitating Jesus' death. Jesus knew it before there was a man before there was any human being, he knew it before there was a world. He knew it before there was anything except himself. He knew it because he is God. He knew it because he is God the Son. And it was a plan devised by him or at least a plan to which he assented with God the Father. According to John chapter 12 and verse 34, for most of the Jews of Jesus' day, 
It was their understanding that Messiah would live forever. And that the one whom many believed to be Messiah spoke of dying became a stumbling block to them, dissuading their belief. And so then, why is it why is it that Jesus had to die? Why was Jesus' death a necessity? Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26 might just answer that question as to why was Jesus' death a necessity? Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26 says that in dying once, Jesus did away with sin once and for all. That in order for Jesus to do away with sin, he had to die. And maybe Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 answer the, answer the question as to why Jesus had to die. Saying that through death, through his death, Jesus destroyed the one who had the power of death. That is the devil. And that through his death, Jesus delivered those who through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. If Jesus Christ is going to make anybody free, he had to die. Jesus' death was necessary because unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies... It remains alone. That is the necessity of his death. Consider also the manner of Jesus' death. Jesus must die, and he must die by crucifixion. Jesus said here in John chapter 12, verse 32. He said, If I be lifted up from the earth, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people unto me. And the next verse indicates that he spoke those words signifying what death he should, he should die. He spoke of the agonizing and inglorious death of crucifixion. The victim dying, suspended between earth and heaven, lifted up from the earth. Jesus had told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, As Moses, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Again, speaking of his crucifixion, he said it had to be that way. Jesus intimated to Peter that his crucifixion would fulfill Old Testament scriptures. And indeed, it did. In the various gospel accounts of Jesus' crucifixion and the events of that day, God-inspired writers say very often when telling of the account, they say that various details of Jesus' death and the events surrounding it fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. Why must it be? Why must it be that Jesus, the Son of God, that Jesus, God the Son, 
must suffer the most excruciating, agonizing, humiliating, ignoble, inglorious, God-forsaken, and cursed death known to man in any age. Why is it that Jesus must die by such a horrific death as crucifixion? Perhaps it is that our sin, that the sin of mankind is such an affront to the holy God that only the most severe of punishments is sufficient to atone for it. Maybe it is that Jesus had to die by crucifixion because our sin is so egregious to God that only the worst punishment could possibly atone for it. Indeed, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 says that without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, no remission of sin, and nothing short of the blood of the crucified one could suffice in atoning for our sins. And so, having considered the necessity of Jesus' death and the manner of Jesus' death, let us look lastly at the result of Jesus' death. Jesus must die by crucifixion in order to produce fruit. And so we go again back to our text in John chapter 12 and verse 24 where it says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, if it dies, it produces much fruit. And Jesus said again in John chapter 12 and verse 32, If I be lifted up, speaking of his crucifixion, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people unto me. And the fruit, the fruit that Jesus' death produces is comprised of the people that are drawn to him by faith. The fruit that Jesus' death produces is his church. All who follow after him, wherever they may be, they are the fruit that Jesus' death produces. The church began with a few apostles and some disorganized followers usually cowering in secret places. And then, as Jesus had promised, the Holy Spirit fell upon those few followers. And that few dozen followers grew to 3,000 And before long, a witness for Jesus Christ seeped into Jerusalem and throughout Judea. It spread to Samaria and a witness for Jesus Christ eventually flooded the uttermost parts of the earth. For two millennia, governments have unsuccessfully tried to silence the voice of Jesus Christ in his church. For two millennia, even religious institutions have tried to stifle the flame of Jesus' church. While the armies of unbelief have used the sword to suppress the message of Jesus Christ. And yet, 
the church of Jesus Christ, whether for its own cause or for Christ's cause, that church has suffered ill treatment at the hands of men. It has suffered persecution at the hands of governments. And it has endured affliction and attack from the devil himself. Yet still, the church of Jesus Christ persists. It perseveres. It continues. It grows. It still produces fruit. Its trunk might be painfully gnarled and twisted by tribulation, but the church of Jesus Christ still produces fruit. It has produced fruit for 2,000 years, and it will continue to produce fruit until Jesus uproots it from the earth. And whether it be like the fruitful church of ancient Philadelphia, before whom Jesus set an open door, or whether it be like the Laodicean church, outside of which Jesus stood behind a closed door knocking. After two millennia, the church of Jesus Christ still produces fruit. And it will be fruitful today. And how could such a thing be? How could it be that the church of Jesus Christ, hated by the world to such an extent, to such an extent that it seeks to extinguish it, how could it be that such a thing still produces fruit? Perhaps it is that the church is not now, nor ever has been, about the church. The church is about Jesus Christ. The church is not about the church. The church is about its head, Jesus the Christ. And Jesus Christ himself said that he must die. Jesus Christ himself said that he must die by crucifixion. Jesus Christ himself said that he must die by crucifixion in order to produce fruit. Verily, verily, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Amen. Find us together, Lord, find us together with cords that cannot be broken. Find us together, Lord, find us together, Lord, find us.
Jesus will use you this day, this week, to produce fruit for him. Amen. Amen.